the first speaker is his name is Jan Valta, and he's a composer, conductor, uh, arranger. I'm not sure what arranger is actually, but maybe he will explain. And he worked uh, on in War Horse, on Kingdom Come Deliverance, but he also traveled uh, the world with uh, Harold Quartet Ensemble, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. And he also worked in uh, Czech Philharmonic Orchestra for two years. Now, when I asked him, yes, that's better. When I asked him how did he got the job uh, at Warhorse, he said, "Well, I made something for Arakine, the band." And he said, "And you know, you know Dan Vavra, he's a death metalist. So he liked my work, and he said to me." I have a job for you, and I said yes. So, without further ado, please welcome Jan Walter. Right. Hi. I typically start talks about uh, uh, music from Kingdom Come Deliverance with the next two slides, saying that for Many years I thought that the most challenging thing a composer can do is to compose an opera. Uh, after I have done this, I know it wasn't true, this is much harder. Uh, so, uh, as uh, it was already said, I'm composer, orchestrator and conductor of Aurora Studios and I worked on Kingdom Come Deliverance. Uh, I did some other cool things and uh, I do have a master degree and I studied music but it's not that important and also if you saw the first slide the subtitle of the ch of, of my talk is 2000 hours of work in 30 minutes talk so I shouldn't you know uh, dwell on things and, and move on and cut in but what I can't skip is to talk about the second person who was responsible for music in Kingdom Come Deliverance which is my esteemed colleague Adam Sporka uh, he is adaptive music designer at Warrior Studios what it is, that means he was responsible for technical implementation of the music in the game and uh, uh, that included uh, our very own music engine called Sequence Music Engine for instance plus lots and lots of uh, decisions, you know, like technical slash design slash whatever else, dramaturgical decisions and he also contributed to uh, musical content of it uh, mostly with uh, those of the medieval tracks they were live recorded. So that's the, that's the team. Now, do I have to do this, or is there is there somebody who who doesn't know what Kingdom Come Deliverance is? If please, can you raise your hand? So, cool, cool. We we actually save two minutes, and I'm flattered. Okay, but this way, uh, I won't spare you this one. So this is you know introducing Kingdom Come Deliverance my way. Uh, so we had about five hours of music. To be precise, it was 321, and one hour of transitions. Now, what's the transitions? Uh, we have these tiny little bits of music, they are able to connect one track with another and it sounds seamless and it's very cool and it sounds as if it was composed that way no matter what you do with the music. And there was about 1000 of these little transitions, they were very very hard to compose and produce and we call them little shits and that's, that's the extra hour. So that's the approximation and then uh, 203 tracks I believe in musical sense, of course some of them were sliced but you are all game designers, so you know what this is about. Uh, as for themes, well, uh, Kingdom Come is a vast, big world. It's a big game, it's a large story, so yeah, I definitely need a lot and a lot of tunes. I stopped counting when I reached 30, so I don't know actually. I, I have no idea how many themes is there, a lot. And we had five types of music. Well, you can divide the music we have in our game into many ways, and uh, none of uh, such divisions will actually uh, explain what the music is about, uh, better or worse. So uh, this is like the easiest one based on a lineup. So we had a uh, live recorded symphony orchestra, we hired about 60 musicians in Prague, we hired uh, Dvořák Hall of the Rudolfino, which is a wonderful hall, and we spent there one full day, started at 9 a.m., finishing at... It was actually meant to finish at 11 p.m., but we, we finished one hour earlier, so we were sooner in pub, of course. And uh, we recorded about 90 plus minutes in one day, which probably we set a Central Europe record. Uh, that was cool. Then we recorded live uh, period instruments with a group called Bakhus. That was mainly Adam's pieces. Uh, we also live recorded a men's choir in a small church in Charslav. And 
Uh, there were two uh, parts of the soundtrack uh, recorded, that, um, um, produced in samples as well, which was symphony music, again, and period music. What's the difference? Well, the live ones were meant for cutscenes mainly, and uh, the, the ones produced in samples were done for, for in-game. Now, hang on, I need to do something with this because I'm probably taller than I expected. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> That's cool now, yeah, but then I don't see what I should read, but anyway, okay. <laughs> well, we'll sort it out, that's no problem. So how much work it needed? I started working in some July 2014. The first I did was uh, the Alpha Teaser, uh, um, and it was already a piece of music uh, which took me about four or five completely different versions until we read something which both Daniel Lavra and I liked. Uh, but it was good because at the very beginning of our cooperation, we, we hit a common ground that's very important you know, for you as a designer and me as a, a composer or any other composer eventually. Uh, and uh, it also showed me the way which I can follow with the rest of the soundtrack. So that was very crucial, very important. And the last asset which I added to the game was somewhere August 2017, but then we spent quite a lot of time testing and, and polishing. Now, you can't polish uh, you know, the, the music itself. You can't polish the assets, like changing tones, notes, chords, or whatever. That's done. That's done. You are, you know, the, the, the train has gone. But what, what, you, what you can do is you can change the way the music behaves, sort of what plays where, how long it lasts uh, until something else is going to be playing, you know, which tracks plays as a first, which as second, etc. And these things you actually can ad uh, adjust uh, not sooner than in a moment when the, me when the game already looks like a game. Like it works and you, you can play it through, more or less. And that's very, very late. You know how this is, you know, games are actually constantly unfinished. That's, that's they, they state, they are living creatures, you know. Unkillable, though. So, uh, yeah, so, so that was it. Uh, um, 2200 recorded, well, 2247, I checked yesterday when I was doing this. So, 2247 recorded hours. But I probably guess that uh, you all know that you, if you work on a larger project uh, and you put your heart into it, you actually never stop working. So, even in bed, you know, even while sleeping or doing everything else, you still keep thinking about it problem you need to solve, you know, in that next asset or some technical solution or whatever it is. So it might well as, as well be, say, close to 3,000 hours plus all the work of Adam. So it was very, very time consuming. But though it was our first game, now we are working on another project with Warhol Studios. I can't say a word, they would kill me. And the way the execution is done in Warhol Studios is medieval, so I will not go there. I'm sorry, <clears throat> but it's going to be awesome. And now we are a bit more clever, so we don't do old mistakes, we find new ones. So probably we will not spend that much time on it this time. Okay, now, <clears throat> and this is uh, quite precise because I've done the math. Uh, so if you, if you see, the, these are my hours, like how much of work actually. Uh, I'm a composer and I have been allowed to compose only one third of the time I spend on the project. The rest goes to design and production. More closely on that, um, yeah, this is quite a good slide, what a game composer does. Uh, I'll try to make it short because I have something else prepared in the second part of the talk. So, uh, very briefly, well, making initial decisions, that's where uh, the lead designer or director or whoever is in charge, uh, input is very, very much needed. So Daniel Vavra came to me, you know, uh, and over first period together, he told me already what he wants. It was like symphony orchestra, in a style of 70s or 80s Hollywood soundtrack. He prefers John Williams, he doesn't prefer Hans Zimmer, that is, he prefers strong themes, not sound design. And uh, he also wanted me to connect this together with uh, music of, say, Czech New Wave, uh, particularly composers such as Zdenek Liška and Luboš Fischer. I'm not sure if I implemented something of Zdenek Liška into it, but I definitely did cheat it and I stole some of the style of Luboš Fischer, for which I'm sorry, on the other hand, Luboš Fischer was a genius, so that can pass. Uh, once these decisions are done, like, you know, genre, subgenre, and line up the orchestration, sort of, like, what kind of instruments you're going to use, uh, you need to quickly set up a set of rules. And it's quite interesting because you are actually making rules for yourself to obey them. But it's good. If you don't have any rules as a composer, if you don't have any borders, you feel like, uh, what's that, uh, the, the testing area in CryEngine, you know, these white tiles, you know, endless, you know, everywhere you look and then this completely blue sky, nothing else. So 
yeah, it's complete freedom, but it's actually, you know, it's so vast that, it, you know, it's, it's actually void. So, so it's terrifying. So the sooner you start making some barriers for yourself, the better. And also what the, what the rules do, and you will see some because I will mention them in, later in the talk, uh, they also let you decide faster. So you know better, you know sooner what to do. You don't repeat uh, mistakes. You sort of uh, don't go into dead alleys, you know. That's also good for, you know, uh, the, from a practical standpoint. And from a musical standpoint, another good thing is that if you do this and you stick by the rules with all tracks you have, but really all of them, every single track in the game will have something uh, in common with the others. In case you, this, you, you do this, you actually uh, achieve to make a homogeneous soundtrack, which is something which is important. I believe music should mostly uh, connect things together, not disband them, not, not, uh, not divide them, unless, of course, special occasions ask so. So that's another thing. Uh, then there is design. Well, I could talk for hours about design, but I will not because nobody will stay here. It's not that interesting, I'm afraid. Uh, but yeah, what's mentioned there, uh, locations, NPCs, characters, features, those are the things you actually have to cherry pick uh, yourself. You might say, well, what for? Definitely, you know, somebody else already uh, made the area. Uh, on all the uh, all the areas in a map somewhere in the cry engine or whichever whichever uh, engine you use, because there are so many people working on the game. Yes, but uh, for instance, the locations every el everybody else in the team uses are not the same locations the music needs. Uh, quick example: say you have a castle. Well, for everyone else, uh, the, the castle starts with the very walls of the castle. Well, for me as a composer, it. It's not there. That's it's 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 uh, it would be actually wrong. What you want to have for a castle is a majestic, huge. I hate the word, but say epic music. You know, something very strong, something knightly, right? And you can't play this inside. You must play it somewhere from where you actually see the castle, how majestic and knightly and epic it is. So that's why your area for the castle starts actually from the places where you see it. Say nearby, you know, 100 meters, 200 meters from. The, from the actual building. Contrary to that, if you actually enter the building, uh, you no longer see its epicness and nightliness and whatever else it is, uh, and you can start playing much more modest music. So that's why uh, you have to do this all on your own. And of course, you need to think about how the music would work. You know the, the way it will, uh, you know the, the transitions of one track to another, and etc. etc. That's a whole complete story. Um, yeah. Planning, another thing, uh, it's, of course, uh, if you do, if you work on such a, such a wonderful pro project as Kingdom Come was, definitely, your will to give and sacrifice anything is endless, but your time frame isn't, you know, one day somebody will come and they will ask you, like, where is the music, because, you know, they need to deliver it, you know, and they need to release it, you know, in, in order to earn some money in the end of the day. So, you need to... Uh, think very carefully how many assets you are actually able to promise to the studio, like how many pieces and uh, in which locations or situation, how many pieces of music per such. Uh, and this is quite complicated because at the beginning you can't tell how long it will last. Uh, you know, now I know I can tell like I don't know symphony orchestra music. I can compose it into a silly demo within say one hour per minute produce it in with another two hours per minute and make the transitions within another two and a five, uh, the 2.5 hours. So that's not, what would I know now, but I've done the game. Uh, at the beginning we didn't know everything. We actually didn't know nothing and we needed to make these decisions. Uh, composing, yeah, that's the next thing on the list. I did that too, time from time. And production, uh, there are two parts of it, you know, one is uh, the complicated and time consuming and the other one is actually the easier one for me. Uh, the complicated one was in samples because, you know, it's not just you buy the best samples available, you do, yeah, sure, but uh, you also need to know how the orchestra sounds, you need to know how specifically every single instrument works. So uh, you can sort of predict what the real musician would do in sort of phrasing, articulation, where he would breathe, where he would uh, slow down a bit before some solo, where he would come up, you know, emphasizing some nice note, etc., and do these little imperfections. That's what makes uh, the sound of samples much, much more uh, realistic. And the live recording, that's actually the easier part for me because I'm an old school guy, so I compose into scores. No ink, no paper, no feather, uh, no audition software, but still 
I do make uh, scores. So once I'm done, I can't produce a fantastic demo. Well, now I can because there is a new feature called new, No Performer, but that wasn't uh, possible when uh, Kingdom Come was in progress. But what I can produce instantly is actually almost finished score and also sheet music for musicians. So it's like you make it difficult on one place, it will be easier on another one. And vice versa, it's like a water bed, you know, like everywhere else. Post-production, well, yeah, that's something musician has to be by too as well. Editing, mastering, we didn't do too much of mixing because thanks to those scores and everything, I can actually mix whilst composing. I just put in the dynamics, the way musicians should play. So they know whether they should play loud or silently, what they should do with every single note. And if they do it, and they do because they are professionals and they read this on the fly the same way you would read a book aloud, uh, also with a bit of you know, expression, uh, if they do that, you actually, in the end of the recording, have uh, finished already sort of mixed recording. So the only thing you do is editing and some mastering and of course preparing the assets for putting into the game, which is a special thing for, for a video game soundtrack. Testing, I've been talking about that. And yeah, if you are lucky enough, uh, you can even uh, uh, survive long enough to make some DLCs. We had four and number two, there was a little of new music and number three, a bit more. And number four, there was quite a lot of new music, including two songs who are dear to me because I composed them. Okay, now uh, I've been thinking about what to, what to address of all those things because there's so many. Uh, and you know, I've been doing some talks previously talking about sort of like what the music team is and, and how you should treat your composer being designers, for instance or developers, what the composer should need, etc, etc. Uh, but I actually realized I never talked about uh, how the composing itself looked like. So I'll try to show something to you. Let's see if it's going to work. I hope so. Uh, yeah, uh, I will sh this will have like two parts. The first is, uh, I will show you something which I call dramaturgical cross, dramaturgical exige. Don't expect something uh, ingenious. It's just a very simple well, tool, yeah, maybe tool, okay to uh, transform, uh, uh, yeah, translating game into music through music elements. That's what it does. You have something in the real world, or say in the game world, and you want to translate it, uh, transmutate it into some musical elements which you can use in your compositions. And uh, I will show you that, and then I will show you the real composing, like from scratch, like there is nothing, and how do I add, you know, the, these notes and everything. Not completely real time because we wouldn't be, we, we wouldn't have enough time. Okay, for that I uh, decided to choose one of the tracks for Sasa Monastery, which is a wonderful place in our game. Well, it's a monastery that tells a lot. And I will say one more thing, uh, uh, thinking of it. Uh, there are two ways you can actually compose uh, music, say in a style of John Williams or whatever it is. That is thematic music, music with strong themes, things you can remember, and if you read them after 20 hours, you are like, oh yeah, that's, that's the melody I heard, you know, back there, I know. And you can also whistle it and whatever. So it's, it's, it's like a strong melody, that's, that's what you need. Two ways, the one way is the blessed one. That's, you know, you walk in the street, you start whistling for some silly reason, and you realize that what you whistle is actually new, and it sounds like a good theme. So you develop it a bit, and you're like, cool, you, pro, you, you, you uh, find your cell phone, you just whistle it into it, you make some notes like what it should be, and you have a theme ready to be, you know, uh, working on it in the future. That's cool and it happens. The more you compose, the more it happens. Uh, for those of you who played Kingdom Come Deliverance, that for instance happened with me with a the theme for the Townback Castle. I just went in my office uh, on the I have to say it, lavatory. On the way there, I whistled the first part. On the way back, I whistled the second one. I just typed a few notes, you know, like on a piece of paper. I just dropped it uh, under my table. There are so many things under my table. And uh, after two months, when I have to start it, uh, at, at, uh, to, to, to work on music for, for Thunberg, I just dived in, I found that piece of paper, and, uh, you know, to do the rest, like, the, you know, the accompaniment and bass and a bit of a form and some percussion that took no time. So I've composed this, like, within 30 minutes or something. And I personally find it's maybe the best theme I've produced. So, yeah, that was the blessed way. I don't know how that happened. It's probably because I composed a lot and I gave my head a bit spare time. I didn't ask anything, any tasks. So the head kept spinning and it produced theme on its own. That's lovely but it's not happening every time. And being a professional composer means that you deliver even if you don't have any inspiration at all. 
which is the hard way. I will show you the hard way. So, dermatological cross, how does it look? You do this, and then you do this. That's not everything. Uh, do this, keywords. Now, now, yeah, now, this is important. What's keywords? It should be strong words, emotionally strong words. They should resemble the, okay, this one is Sasa Monastery, so the location. It's uh, spirit. It should also be something which, when I see the words, it gives kind of emotion to myself as a composer. It must be sort of, I hate the word again, I hate so many words, exciting, you know, uh, in a way. So, so this is very important. And it's good to think it that way. Like, okay, if this is the location, what would be Henry, which is the main character of Kingdom Cadillac Lorenzo, your avatar in the game, what would Henry think of that place? What would his ex impression of the place be? And try to find words they would describe that. So, honestly, I don't remember exactly how it was when I was doing this, it's like five years ago, but I tried to reproduce it. So the first draft would be like this, very shortly, well, sacred ground, for sure, monks, now, really surprised. Ancient, that's a bit, that's a bit uh, odd, because actually for Henry, it probably would, wouldn't look that ancient. You know, all the important buildings in Sasa Monastery, which is the new church, and which is the, 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 the real monastery, the new part, that was built in 14th century, and our game uh, takes place beginning 15th century. So for him, it was actually like, you know, normal Gothic, like everybody else, he probably saw it in so many churches around. So he, he wouldn't think it's ancient, but player does. And if I can choose in between uh, emphasizing an emotion of the character in the game or the player himself, I always choose the player because, you know, he pays the bucks. So he's the boss. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, safe place for monks and a wonder for ordinary people. Yeah. Also a place where ordinary people have no way to come in. World within a wall. That's a good one. I like that one. Because, you know, imagine you have this wall. On, on the other side, on one side of the wall, there is a field and somebody's working there and he's living in the village and he's having a normal life, you know, get drunk, having sex, you know, playing dice, producing kids, you know. Bankrupt, no, that was medieval times, that was, that, was, that was impossible, but anyway, just living, you know. And then on the other side of the wall, there are people, they have completely different way of living. They have their routine, they have uh, their rules, you know, they have their prayers, they have their kneeling, they have their service to God only. So this is like world within a world, very interesting. Eternal, that might be the word which would describe what Henry would think about it, particularly because he couldn't possibly... Uh, expect what will happen with the church, you know, just, you know, a couple of decades later, and then eventually, uh, you know, with all the enlightenment and secularism and everything, uh, the church will eventually lose its power over the world. So, to everybody in the medieval times, it must be like the church is there forever. And also, God is eternal, and we are eternal, eternally sinful and everything, so eternity, that's a good word. No women, yeah, sad, but true. Contrasting with nearby village. Okay, so, so th that's, that's uh, sort of what I would produce, like a first draft. But these are too many, and you, same as I did, uh, probably see that some of the things are actually like repetitive. They are duplicit. So let's scratch some of those, because we can't have so many keywords in order to, you know, actually finally fill in the right side of the dramaturgical cross. So let's scratch those. Safe place for monks, the wonderful ordinary people. Good, because what will the world say it all? Also, this eternal I've been talking about. Eternal might be for Henry. Ancient, that's for player. I choose the player way. No women, yeah. If I say monks, it's logical that there are no women. Women. Uh, I mean, yes, there were also monasteries. There were mixed, there were nuns and monks together, but this is not the case of Sasa Monastery, you know. So, no women, not necessary to say. Monks say it all. And contrasting with the Bible village, again, world within the world is strong enough. Now, these are the four words you actually produce after you do the scratching and which one of them would be the most powerful. Now, if somebody didn't play Kingdom Come Deliverance and doesn't want uh, me to spoil it now, spoiler alert for 10 seconds so mute your, you know, unplug something within or something. Uh, well, Henry is there on a mission, uh, he is investigating something and in order to actually get into uh, uh, the monastery, he must become a monk. So for him, definitely the monks would be the most important thing. Also, if you think about it, we have other sacred places, sacred grounds, uh, in our game, there are other churches, there are, uh, there are uh, cemeteries, there are wayside shrines, you know, the God was everywhere. We are talking medieval time, okay? Uh, so people were quite a lot religious. But the monks, that's what makes the, the monastery special. So, yeah, that would be the real order. And now comes uh, the moment where you try to translate these 
words into musical terms, into musical uh, meaning. So, with music elements. So, monks. What monks would do in a music? Well, for sure, first thing I would say it's a men's choir singing some choral. That sounds quite logical, right? So, sort of a Gregorian chant. So, let's put it in. And also, thinking about the accompaniment, it would be simple. It couldn't be, you know, too ornamental. It could be too rich. Because uh, uh, monks were simple people. I mean, they, had lived, they were living a simple life. They were humble, you know. They couldn't be rich. They didn't have any uh, passions in their life. You know, they had just this routine they were following and they were, they were just serving God. So, if any accompaniment, and we want to have some accompaniment, that's what I have to say. This is meant for the outer part of the monastery, not for the cloister. In the cloister, which is the sacred area, you know, the inner circle within the circle, that's the place where only monks are allowed, right? And there we have real Gregorian chant, sung, uh, sung uh, live, recorded. Adam, uh, my colleague, composed that. So I wanted to have a bit of variety. So in this outer part of the cloister, of, of the monastery, not in the cloister itself, uh, I need to have some, some accompaniment in order to simply offer something else, something different. Otherwise everything would sound the same. So simple accompaniment, that's what monks would give me and men's choir. So far, good. Now, ancient. It starts to be a bit more complicated, I'm sorry. Uh, you know what's fifth? Uh, fifth is an interval mm -hmm, in between two tones, that's a fifth. I'm sorry I can't sing two voices together, I can't. Okay, you can't, neither. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, if you peruse this mm -hmm, and you don't put any extra tone within it, which would make three tones that would make a chord, and you have just those two, that's an open fifth, prasna quinta in Czech. And if you move these two, two voices the same step up or down, you are making a parallel move. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, whatever. And that's something which just a couple of centuries later would be considered a mistake. If somebody did that, you know, in a musical school, you know, they would do this. And, this is wrong, we can't do parallel fifths, you know, it spoils the harmony. You know? But we are in medieval times and they did a lot of parallels, you know, parallel fifths, parallel fourths, sometimes even sixths, not too much of a third, because third was considered a bit of a dirty interval. That's actually why, if you see the second part of it, almost no thirds. What's third? So the third tone, that's the, uh, that's the third. And it should be either major, major or minor. Major is typically happy, minor is typically sad. No, because in, in medieval times they didn't have this. You know, that's kind of a, I wouldn't say construct, it's more like a tradition. We are used to it. If we hear something which is in minor key, we say, oh, so sad. If we hear something which is major, we say, oh, happy, yeah. Because that's how composers do it. It's the simplest way. Yeah, I would do it if I could, but I can't because I make a medieval game. So I had to go without thirds, almost everywhere. If you look at any theme in this game, except for the theme of parents, I believe, there are no thirds. So, yeah, and it's like, you know, trying to compose with your hands tied behind your back, but you need to find a way around. And it actually pays off because if you produce that, you can maintain this ancient feel, medieval feel. So yeah, ancient means for me parallel open fifths. I will play uh, some for you so you will know what, it, what I'm talking about. And no thirds. Enough for the theory. Now, sacred ground. Uh, okay, so this is an interesting. Music flow is driven by lyrics. What does it mean? Well, the music uh, the monks were singing wasn't that important. It was composed by some monk who was, of course, sinful, as we all are sinful, including the monks. But the word, the lyrics, that came from some holy man or even better from apostle or even even better from christ from the god so the word ruled the music not vice versa so the word was the more important how does it look in, in in music for instance now again we are used to have everything either in four one two three four one two three four or in three one two three one two three with three being kind of like a dance because it resembles a waltz okay and four that's useful for everything else. Mm -hmm. So much for the, 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 the tradition, and that's how we got there. Uh, but again, in medieval times, if you listen to any Gregorian chant or something like that, it's simply not that, you know. They have like one phrase which has five beats, the next has three beats, another one has seven beats. It depends on the length of the words. It depends on, on the, simply on, on how many syllables you need to put in, you know. And of course, if you want to emphasize some of the words. So that's what, uh, drives the music and I wanted to achieve this <clears throat> that's one of the rules again which I use everywhere so I'm changing the what's called the music time signatures so you have 4-4 four, four, 
you have four beats in one bar, four beats in second bar, then suddenly five beats in another one. I'm always trying to keep this, you know, non-periodical, a bit irregular, because that's what medieval music was about. And the last thing, well, world within a world is a wonderful thing, but actually the only thing I can say is it should differ from any other music asset in the game, because it's completely different than anywhere in the game. Now, uh, try to remember these music elements and let's compose. I think I'm already uh, too long. Yes, you're going to see some music. Sorry about that. So this is it. We were, t we were talking about uh, a choir, men's choir. So this, these are the bases. So far it's just empty. Okay, uh, it's gonna be very slow. 66 BPM, not 666 BPM. Just, just two sixes, not three. Right, now yeah, I know. Okay, uh, simple accompaniment would be these. Okay, so that's violoncelli and contrabassi. That's cellos and basses. What they would do and why I chose them instead of say brass or woodwinds or piano. But I don't use piano. And no piano it was allowed uh, in, in uh, well, I mean, like, no animal was harmed and no piano was used in Kingdom Come. Uh, thinking of it. Adam maybe used one in one of his combats, but, you know, he sort of, like, poked it in and I didn't realize it. But other than that, there is no piano. Why? Again, it was too modern. It's too modern sound and it's so much overused everywhere, so I wanted, you know, Kingdom Come to sound differently than anything else. I don't know if we achieved that. At least I didn't want to uh, repeat this kind of a... Cliche, if I can, can say it. No offense taken. Uh, no, no, no offense meant. <laughs> also taken. Right. So, uh, uh, why, why strings? These are the low strings, cello and basses. They would uh, go in nicely with the basses, with the singers, so because they are in roughly the same uh, range. And strings have this uh, uh, incredibly good thing. If you need a very, very super long note, almost endless, give it to strings. They can just switch. The, the direction of the, the way they are making the bowing. Did I tell you I'm a violinist originally? Yes, I am, but I didn't uh, bring the instrument here. Anyway, so they can just uh, switch it, and if you have a group of, say, 12 musicians playing the same note, everyone can do it in a different place, so in a different moment, uh, in a different time. So what you produce is actually endless tone. That's fantastic. And that's what we're going to need here. So that's why I chose strings instead of brass or woodwinds. Uh, yeah, but that would be a bit too dull, so let's add, okay, harp, that's a good idea. You know, harp, at least not the, the modern one, uh, that wasn't possible in medieval times, of course, with, you know, all the chromatic shifting and everything, that's a quite complicated instrument. But there were already many plucking instruments, you know, pluck instruments, such as lutes, sort of guitars, you know, and liras, actually, that, that, that's, I think, that originates even from Greece or maybe earlier than that. So that was already there, you know, for, for, for centuries and centuries. So if you add harp, they will definitely do no harm. Uh, speaking of sort of like historical accuracy, more or less. And also, I like harp because it also brings kind of a nobility. Something, you know, it makes it always better, brighter, higher. I don't know how to express it otherwise. And last thing, campanello. Okay, that's, you know, have you seen monks, you know, walking uh, through the church and singing? They are just going like this, you know, and then one of them has this bell and he always does and they are so this is actually what I wanted to achieve. He's giving them a sign like, hey, let's sing, okay? And I wanted to have this because again, all the things I told you in the dramaturgical cross I'm trying to transfer into music. So this is the lineup, let's start composing. So this is the first phrase. Uh, hang on, and now it starts to be technically difficult for a composer because I need to find my... Can I show this? Okay, Warhol Studios now. Bass is ahead. So that's the first part. Let's see. Thank you, Houston. Wonderful. So, those are the first four notes. I will close this. I'm sorry. I need to... Later, okay? Sorry about that. Sorry. Okay, so these are the first four notes. Dee -da -dee -da. Nothing special on it, right? Well, yes and no. If you realize the, -da -dee -da, the lower one, that's the, that's the bass note of the scale. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't start from there. -da -dee -da. It starts from the fifth already. Sort of like somewhere mid-air, not grounded, which I find quite good for monks and people of the cloth. Uh, another thing, if I would do... Uh, the third, I told you, no third, so uh, if I would use a, a third, it would sound either like this, that would be the minor third. I didn't want that because it sounds 
more like some, you know, Russian villagers, you know, just talking, <laughs> chewing the fat, like, have hard life, you know, yeah, under, yeah, Yeltsin, yeah, better times. They don't want this. And also, even the major one wouldn't be any better. <laughs> nice opening of any theme but it's a different project but this be da dee ba no thirds and you are uh, not spoiling the feeling of, of ancient times now what to do next okay uh, okay the second part of the theme would be a bit more different uh, <laughs> I'm adding a bit more variety of it and also you see that I'm already trying to change the, the time signature the three and two uh, uh, in bar six, that changes the number of beats per per bar, and uh, I'll play this part again. Cool. Okay. What did what it does? Now, now we have this first phrase, which you might call a head of the theme. Now, there are two important things to uh, to mention. This step, that's the fifth down. Uh, if you do such a jump in a melody, you make the melody more memorable. If it would be all time just semitones and full tones, whatever it is, whole tones, it would be boring. So if you do such a step, bigger step, it's memorable. And also, that's a semitone, semitone. And semitone always creates kind of a tension in music. More than that, it's leaning against the again against the fifth. So it started with the same tone, B da di da 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 da, and it ends, it lands on the same tone again. So it's kind of like eternally overwhelming, you know, around itself and actually not going anywhere. Sort of like we can talk about God, we can think about what He is, but we will actually never know, do we? So that's what I wanted to sort of achieve, like what the, the monks would be singing about. Now the second part of uh, the, of of this uh, theme would be, it's always good, oh yeah, I forgot to say this, um, sorry to say, uh, uh, I actually, com I was composing this and I was like, there that, that should be some lyrics, you know, that's actually, I told you, it should be driven by lyrics, the music, right? So, uh, I thought about these lyrics and I know they are wrong, because if it's Latin, it should be Sanctus Procopius, but Procopius, by the way, well, he was a hermit and he was a founder of the, of the, of the Sasa Monastery, you know. So that's why, you no. Know, San Procopio, Sora Pro Nobis. That sounds already quite monkish, already quite Gregorian chant, quite ancient, doesn't it? Yeah, cool. And now I have done the second part of, of, the, of the melody. I will play this for you once again. I'm sorry, it's so long. see the second part it started the same way as the first one but then, then it evolves it's, it goes different way and I, I add one particular thing which I'm not sure whether you, you, you can uh, sort of like realize but you know this is a C major and if you look in bar five in bar six there is a C so I'm, I'm like actually changing the tonality I'm changing the sort of metro no, no not the metro the the, the, uh, the scale within the piece which we have been told that that's not what's going on in our old times. Yes, that's exactly what they were doing. They were doing this, they were constantly shifting. They took one tone and, and they, they, they put it a semitone higher or lower uh, in uh, between, you know, somewhere in the middle of, of the music. And it created an extra tension. So, so much for the melody. I was like happy. And then the accompaniment. So, I set strings. So these are the strings and they play senza vibrato. That means no, uh, they play flat. Like, again, like a simple singing, okay? Uh, and they play the open fifths I've been talking about. Okay, so I'll play this for you. Don't worry, it will be, now it will be only shorter and better. Okay, so Joris, Joris Bassi, open fifth. <coughs> in medieval times okay but <laughs> I know yeah ask me okay but uh, that would be a bit uh, too simple uh, so that's why I added harp which actually plays the same you know but it also adds the upper octave 
so it will, will, sound, uh, will sound richer and a bit better. So I will add the harp to this, that's just the accompaniment. Better, okay. So I was almost satisfied, but then I, then I told you there is this little bell, and they start singing, okay, the sign. Okay, so I wanted to do this, and that's why I put the campanello in, which is thing. And now the accompaniment will be fulfilled with the campanello. They start singing, okay? Cool. Right. <clears throat> and with all this, you know, actually, that's, that's the theme. That, 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 that whole piece that's done. I can play it to you now in its entirety and in better samples. That's, that's the way we put it into the game. That's exactly how I compose. And if you think about it, actually everything, every single decision I've made as a composer in this piece, as well as in any other piece in the whole game, I've done it because the game told me to. And it's not like you know I'm sh sh you know some some uh, shrink person or something. No, I mean like for real. I've I've really taken these uh, these dramaturgical cross. I've already did this you know thinking what would be the keywords, what would uh, represent them, and I then simply put that in the score. So this is the way you create music, which then, I believe, <coughs> it's not only, as we check say, a bit of so hrálo, like some background music, you know, and just put, put something in there, because it's too, you know, it's too silent, it's too empty, so put there something. No, I mean, uh, it, the music always should have some added value, okay, something extra. It's not just, okay, you play because nobody else is playing, so you're going to play something. It should always bring something extra. And this, what I've shown you, I believe this is a good way how to make it work for a game. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.